so many people here. Uh, thanks for sitting up front as well and leaving the, the roped off section clear. Uh, I'm really excited for the presentation today. I want to do a couple of quick announcements though, just for those of you who are in the class so that you're on track with the, uh, the assignments that we have. And then I'll introduce our uh, presenters today. So first of all, if you haven't already done so, you need to take the orientation survey in Canvas. Almost everyone has, but if you added late or if something else has happened, um, go into Canvas and, and take the orientation survey. Uh, today, being here is, it means that you're fulfilling one of the requirements. The, it's your first of 10 uh, required attendance days. Uh, make sure at the end of the presentation to go into Canvas. For every day you attend, you should do a response as well. So there's, a, there's an assignment called Professing Response, which is um, part of the title for today. So after, it will open at 1.20. Go in and take that. It will take you just a couple minutes, but it will give you a chance to reflect on what you've experienced in class today. Uh, there's still time if you're wanting to take Convocation Plus. Uh, that's the one extra credit that will be um, built off of the work that we do together. If you're interested in taking Convocation Plus as well, I do have handouts up front with some of the, the list of requirements. And uh, feel free to, if you have any interest at all, take one of those. And if you want to enroll, it's GNST 1065. We haven't started that work yet, but the first assignment will begin working on it after the Labor Day holiday. Um, Remember that I'm wanting to shake everyone's hand and that you have some cultural events to attend, but those are ongoing assignments all semester. Uh, there are some more cultural events posted on our calendar that are qualifying, and if you have questions, if something else qualifies, let me know and I can pre-approve things. Finally, uh, I would like you to, to just remind you to be respectful of the presenters today by uh, being quiet and attentive. Also, that's being respectful to the people sitting around you as well. If you're whispering in the back, the presenters may not hear it, but everyone around you will. Uh, so please be quiet, be off your devices, especially because we don't want it interfering with the Wi-Fi from our presenters. And please no food or drink in here as well. And Next time, I hope to have an experiment with a, a way you can text questions in at the end. But today, we will have a Q&A at the end, question and answers, but uh, we'll just do raising of hands uh, for, for today. So in, to, present, or to introduce our presenters today, um, there's just a simple idea behind it, and the idea is that we're, we are all learners, uh, students as well as faculty. Every academic field has learners slash scholars who are asking questions about the world. And that's essentially the same process that you go through in your classes as well. And so the point is for this presentation, as you embark on the semester of, of learning, of studying, of um, realizing things that you know and things that you still need to know, um, I've invited four professors here at Snow College to talk about how they go through that same process. Um, both in personally and then within their fields of study. And uh, so we're, we're all as learners trying to use creativity, collaboration, knowledge, and questioning uh, to, to just learn more about the world around us. So the order of our presenters today are going to go from big to small. The, the first presenter is going to talk about the cosmos, which is, I think, the biggest thing that we could start with. Theoretically, I didn't know if there was a an asterisk by that. And then we're going to talk, have a presenter talk about communities and societies. The third presenter will talk about individuals, and then our fourth presenter will go you know, into what we're made of, our, uh, our DNA the, and genetics. And so I'll introduce each presenter now, and we'll save questions for the end. So our first presenter is Larry Smith. He's a professor of math and physics here at Snow. Um, and he served or is serving as a chair, as a dean, and as the president of the faculty senate. And he has a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. Steve Hood is our next presenter, and he's the vice president for academic affairs here. He's also a scholar of Asian politics, and he earned a PhD from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Greg Wright is an associate professor of English and philosophy, and he served as a department chair and as the co-director of the honors program. He received a PhD from the University of uh, Nevada at Las Vegas. And our final speaker will be Lindsay Cheney, 
Assistant Professor of Biology. She currently chairs the college's curriculum committee, and she's been one of the professors that's piloted the foundation courses that some of you are taking. And she has a PhD from the University of Cincinnati. So will you uh, join me in welcoming, uh, we'll start with Larry Smith, but let's welcome them all to the stage. Thank you, David. It's great to be here. Uh, just in case anybody was going to confuse cosmology with cosmetology, I wore my uh, astronomy socks and my astronomy tie, so you know what we're talking about today. We have a few things uh, in cosmology that we really don't have the answer to. I kind of had to pick and choose because there's more than three. I listed three up here that we'll talk about briefly. Uh, dark matter, dark energy, and we don't even know how old the age of the, what the age of the universe is. So start with the first one, dark matter. Dark matter was discovered back in the 1970s by a female astronomer by the name of Vera Rubin. And uh, the thing is that this dark matter doesn't shine or emit light and it doesn't reflect light, so we can't see it. And that's one of the reasons we call it dark. So we have to look for gravitational effects. And the way that she found this dark matter, even though you can't see it, is by looking at the speed of stars as they rotate around a spiral galaxy. This is a galactic rotation curve you can see the bottom dashed white line. That's what we expect to see from the gravitational effects of the stars that, we can, that shine, that we can see. The top line with the yellow dots and the blue dots, that's actually the data that we take showing that the stars are moving a lot faster than we expect. And the explanation for that is dark matter. We can't see it. We surmise that it has to be there. You might think, well, how sure are you? That doesn't sound like very strong evidence. There are multiple lines of evidence for this dark matter, lots of different gravitational effects, different lines uh, of reasoning that go into this. So all these things point to the existence of dark matter. So we're really sure that it's out there. But what's it made of? What is it? We have no idea. In fact, you could probably go into astronomy, become a cosmologist, figure out what dark matter is made of, and get the Nobel Prize. Moving on, then, our next one is dark energy. Why would we call it dark? Also because it doesn't shine or emit light, but also the dark is reflecting a little bit of our ignorance, that we don't know what it is, and so therefore it's kind of dark in our minds as well. Discovered 20 years after the dark matter, this dark energy is kind of an anti-gravity that tends to push the universe apart. We already knew the universe was expanding, but we were very surprised in the late 1990s to find out that the expansion is accelerating. It's getting faster and faster, which was exactly the opposite of what we expected. We expected gravity to slow it down. So we invented this new idea of dark energy to explain the idea that the expansion is going ever and ever faster and faster. But what is the dark energy? We have no idea. So there's a second Nobel Prize for somebody. This does put us in the very unenviable position of not knowing hardly anything about 96% of the content of our universe. The dark energy is about 73, the dark matter is about 23, add that up, and we don't know very much at all about the vast majority of our universe. Uh, the stars and galaxies that we're made of and the elements that our bodies are made of is just less than 1% of the matter in the universe. Moving on to the third one then, the age of the universe. Some of you might not have even realized that the universe has an age, but the reason we think that it does is because a guy by the name of Edwin Hubble, who the telescope was named after, discovered that the universe is expanding. I mentioned that briefly earlier. And so if it's expanding now, it means that at some time in the past, it must have been much smaller than it is now. And if you kind of extrapolate that all the way back, run the movie backwards, then at some point in the distant past, the universe would have been just this tiny little point of stuff that began to expand. And that time, since then till now, is what we call the age of the universe. Here's some of the preliminary data that Edwin Hubble took in 1929. Um, we want to discuss the graph here, what it means, the distance to the galaxy, each dot is a galaxy, the distance across the bottom axis, and then the, how fast they're moving away from us on the vertical axis. And the straight line shows that there's this relationship saying the farther away a galaxy is, 
the faster it's moving away. And he and another colleague took some more data, published this two years later. All of the data on the previous slide is in the little lower left-hand corner of this slide. This is now more data with further away galaxies showing the same thing. There's this linear relationship between how fast they're moving away from us and how far away they are. And we call that the Hubble Law. And if you draw the straight line through the data, each dot representing one galaxy, the slope of that line, yeah, that's math, that's okay. The slope of that line is called the Hubble constant. Yeah, named after Edwin Hubble. So that, that uh, constant, if you put it back in the equation, you can see that h sub zero, the Hubble constant, would, if you take the inverse of that, like one over the Hubble constant, it would be a time. And in the simple version of this idea, that would be the age of the universe. So one over the Hubble constant is the age of the universe. But all the academic papers aren't talking about the age of the universe directly. They're talking about this Hubble constant. So indirectly, we get the age of the universe from that. Um, so we're going to spend the rest of our two or three minutes here on, on uh, H, not T. But if you're interested to know how old the universe actually is, it's about 13.8 billion years old. This graph is really very interesting. Notice what's on the axes. Across the bottom, we're seeing the year of publication of some academic journal articles. Up to the side, we have the value of this Hubble constant. And you can see as time goes on, we're publishing more and more papers about what the value of the Hubble constant is. Notice that back in the early 2000s, all of the data was sort of uncertain. That's represented by the shaded regions here, kind of error bars on your data. The blue data and the red data agreed, but they weren't very precise. As time goes on, our measurements get better and better, and you can see the error bars getting smaller and smaller. But what's really disturbing is that the one method of measuring the Hubble constant, the blue data, the distance ladder, produces now a very precise number but it's not the same number that the other method of producing the data um, gives us with the, uh, the red triangles there. Our uh, physics department went to the National Association of Physics Conference, uh, Teachers Conference last month in Provo, and uh, they gave us the updated version. So 2018, 2019 data shows even smaller error bars, meaning that we know this even better than we did before, and yet the two types of measurements, the two ways of measuring the Hubble constant are diverging. This is extremely upsetting because how can they both be right and yet we're very confident in both of them. So this is a, another graph showing the same thing. Now the Hubble constant is across the bottom. Uh, you can see that the one method gives a value of about 68. The other value gives a method of about 74. There's another graph showing the same thing. Do we have the answer to this? No, we do not. We do not know what dark matter is. We do not know what dark energy is. And in some sense, we don't even know what the age of the universe is. We have some ideas, but currently these are unanswered. And so, if you stay tuned, there will be some answers in your lifetime, but there will be new unanswered questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dr. Smith. Take me back to my undergraduate days when I had a class on uh, physics at uh, BYU. Absolutely loved the class. Just set their sp spellbound class after class learning uh, this kind of stuff. I'm a political science uh, teacher. And all of you are familiar with this phrase that comes from uh, a famous American document. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal and endowed by their maker with certain unalienable rights among them, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The American founders were really worried about those because they said that they were self-evident. In truth, they may not have been as self-evident as we think. And they knew that, but they were hoping that people would come accustomed to rights. People wouldn't walk around saying, I have a right to free speech. I have a right to, to religion the way I, to worship in my religion the way I want. Those things just weren't in their vernacular. It wasn't what they used on a day-to-day -day basis. What the founders were really worried about, though, is what would happen 
in decades from now when people were used to their rights, what will happen to the republic? Will people rely on their rights more or will they rely on virtue more? They wanted them to rely on virtue. And America is unique. It has two founding periods. The first one was really a religious founding. Some of you may remember the names John Winthrop, uh, William Bradford, um, Cotton Mather, Roger Williams. These are Puritans, right, who came from uh, England and Netherlands and settled on the East Coast of the United States and put together Christian communities. What the founders hoped, the American founders, Jefferson, Madison, Adams, Washington, Franklin, they hoped that people would live by their virtues first and only rely on rights if they had to because they said rights were problematic. Abraham Lincoln worried about it a lot. He had to fight the Civil War based upon rights. At the end of the war, however, it's really interesting that he gave a virtue justification for it, saying that God willed that this should happen. But at the outset, he says, we are violating the rights of, an unknown, of a people from unknown countries that we, who didn't even want to come here. It's getting really, really, really tricky. Let me give you an example. In 2008, the Colorado State Legislature passed a law that said companies, private companies, public agencies could not discriminate against people on the basis of their sexual orientation. They had to be able to have the water hooked up to their house. They had to be able to be sold a house to. They could buy a car if they wanted to. You could not discriminate them against them in any way, shape, or form. It passed overwhelmingly. The governor signed it into, uh, into, into law. A couple of groups decided to challenge it, to go to the Supreme Court and say, no, wait a minute, this isn't right. The Supreme Court at the time in 2008 was a very conservative body. It still is. And they thought, if there's any chance of overturning this law now, the Supreme Court will overturn it. They did not. They did not even agree to hear the case. Not, and if, it's, if a Supreme Court justice decides that they want to hear the case, they can have it brought up on their agenda. But they did not. They did not challenge the law. In 2012, two gay men, Charlie Craig and David Mullins, went to the Masterpiece Cake, uh, cake Shop in Lakewood, Colorado, and requested a man by the name of Jack Phillips, who ran the, the business, to make them a wedding cake. Mr. Phillips said, I am going to respectfully decline to do so. My religious preferences and my religious instincts tell me that I have devoted myself to God, and as such, it would not be serving my Lord and Master if I made a cake for a gay wedding for which I feel is a sin. These gentlemen were taken aback by it, and they went on to another uh, cake company to have their cake made. But the Colorado Civil Rights Commission stepped in and said, wait a minute, you can't do that. We passed this law, and the Supreme Court said, you can't do that. You have to make them a cake. Mr. Phillips refused to do so, got himself an attorney, went to the state Supreme Court. The state Supreme Court of Colorado said, you've got to do it. He still refused to do it. It went to the U.S. District Court and finally to the Circuit Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. Turned down in all cases. It finally went to the U.S. Supreme Court, a very conservative court, and they ruled seven to two in favor of Mr. Phillips, the cake baker. They said that while Mr. Craig and Mr. Mullins has civil protections under the laws of the Constitution, their rights do not outweigh, outweigh the rights of Mr. Phillips' religious rights. This was very controversial. Before, they had refused to look at the Colorado law, and now what they were saying is the way the law is being interpreted is not correct. Well, let's say that a, a gay couple wants electricity to their home, and this happened in a, in a county outside Amarillo, Texas. Following this, a private electrical producer that only has around 2,000 customers was asked to connect the electricity to a home of a gay couple. The owner said that he was refusing service based upon this Supreme Court decision. Texas Supreme Court shot it down and said, no, you cannot deny people basic rights, basic fundamental requirements of living. It went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court refused to hear it, which means that they allowed the ruling at the state Supreme Court 
to stand. It raises a whole bunch of other questions. Can a medical worker, for example, uh, a, 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 any medical worker deny an LGBTQ person medical attention due to their own religious belief? Currently, the federal laws say yes and no. It depends. For example, you may have heard in the news, Vermont, a hospital in Burlington, Vermont, um, re, uh, fired a person who was unwilling to participate in an abortion uh, on, a, uh, on a, uh, a patient recently because she said it was against her religious rights. The federal government is now saying we're going to withhold federal money from this hospital for firing her because this was a religious right, uh, a, a right of hers to practice her religion to deny such services. However, a nurse in Kentucky last year who performed an emergent, who was ordered to perform an emergency abortion on a person, did not do it uh, because she said it was against her religion. But in this case, the doctors had determined it was for the health of the mother. The federal government said, or the, uh, the uh, federal government said, we're going to withhold f money for the hospital because you are under an obligation to perform an abortion in such a case. Do you see how tight this is? It, and it gets tighter and tighter. Can undocumented workers, in other words, uh, people who are in our country un illegally, based on their lack of citizenship, can they be denied rights of freedom, speech, religion, and basic human needs because they are not citizens? Some members of the President Trump's administration say they can. Our American founders would say absolutely not. We had German and, Amer and British citizens living in the United States, they said, because they are human beings, they have rights. But this is an issue that's going to go to the Supreme Court, and it's going to be heard in, in October, just a, a month away. So our democracy is really based upon two tenets. It's virtue and rights. They don't get along very well. And sometimes even people who are making a virtuous argument don't believe, don't get along with somebody else who makes another virtuous argument. Or somebody who does believe in rights is going to be arguing something different than somebody else who's going to be uh, arguing from another position. It will not be decided in courts. It will not be decided in the legislature. The unique thing about the American Republic is it's going to be decided in your homes you're the ones that are going to decide at what point do we tolerate one thing or another? At what point do we modify our views for this thing, but not necessarily this thing? And that is going to require tolerance, compassion, compromise in order to get along. If we don't know how to compromise, and if we can't figure this out, what political scientists are worried about right now is they are literally afraid that our democracy could collapse because we are not ready to handle these difficult situations. So it's something that I hope that as you guys uh, come into the fore and engage in civic dialogue and take your jobs, whether it be in private industry or in government or in education, wherever it is, that you will wrestle and that you'll be open-minded and, op and with open hearts also listen and try to have civic dialogue because we aren't doing a very good job right now of working through it. Thank you. Okay, hi every body. I hope this is working. Um, I'm Greg Wright, and I'm here to talk about a philosophical question that has been debated, uh, argued over for almost the very beginning uh, in ancient Greece. And that question is, do we have free will? Or are all of our choices already been determined? So let me tell you a, a brief story. Um, there's a man, and he is the king of a place in Greece, Thebes, and he hears a prophecy that he's going to have a son, and that his son one day 
will kill him. And eventually marry his mother, his wife, okay, and become the king. So this man, King Laius, decides, well, I don't want that to happen. So he takes his newborn son out into the forest and leaves him where he expects that he'll die. However, a shepherd comes along, finds the infant, and takes him and gives him to another family. Another family in Corinth, different kingdom in Greece. The child is then raised by the king and queen of Corinth. And as he grows older, he hears of a prophecy that he will kill his father and marry his mother. Well, he doesn't want that to happen. Not knowing that he was adopted, he then leaves his adopted father and mother. And while on the road, comes across a man. In an instance of road rage, he kills the man. This man happens to be his biological father. He then meets who he doesn't know is his biological mother, and he eventually marries her and becomes the king of Thebes. So the prophecy is filled. He can't escape his fate. So the question is, did this man, Oedipus, have a choice? This is the concept of hard determinism, okay? which is basically a theory of universal causation. Every effect has a cause. So for example, uh, consider a home run. Well, how did a, a batter get a home run? Well, a home run requires a certain amount of force to hit a ball at a particular launch angle so that it will travel over a wall or a fence, creating a home run. So you have the home run, and what caused it? Well, the batter, in order to hit a home run, has to have a ball. So what causes the batter to hit the ball? There's a pitcher who throws or tosses a ball to the hitter. Well, how did the pitcher then throw the ball? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is an inductive argument um, that explains this concept. So, if every event has an explanatory cause, if every event has a cause, okay, and every choice or action that you undertake is an event. So if every human choice or action, it has to have a cause. The argument continues. So if every human choice or action has an explanatory cause, then to have explanatory causes is not free, then that would mean no human choice or human action is free. Essentially, everything you do has a cause so no action that you take, no choice that you make, was actually free. This is the uh, French uh, scientist Pierre Simon Marquis de Laplace. And he put it uh, very succinctly. He said, we may regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its past and the cause of its future. An intellect a, a being of some superior intellect, which at a certain moment would know all forces that set nature in motion and all positions of all items of which nature is composed, if this intellect were also vast enough to submit these data to analysis, it would embrace in a single formula the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the tiniest atom. For such an intellect, nothing would be uncertain, and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. Essentially, if you knew everything about the laws of nature, if you knew the position of, of everything, you'd be able to tell the future. So, two ways to explain this. A physical explanation. Our bodies are subject to the laws of nature. Okay? If I fall off the stage right here, I am going to fall. It's 
okay, the laws of gravity. Okay? I can't escape that. Now, some might say, well, I don't make a choice with my body. I make a choice with my mind. Right? I, in my mind, I decide I'm going to do this. Okay? However, your consciousness is influenced by previous experiences and previous conditions. So, I'm here in convocations. Well, did I choose to be here? I guess you can say, no, I didn't choose to be here. I'm here because my friend and my colleague asked me if I would come here. And because I value his friendship, I said, yes. Well, how can I value friendship? Well, my parents taught me that I should value friendship. Why did my parents teach me to value friendship? Because, and it goes on and on into the past. This is something that's interesting. Just this year, in March, there was a study published by a couple of neuroscientists in Australia. Okay? They were able to determine, in their study, they were able to detect the choices that their study participants would make 12 seconds in advance. So the study participant is given uh, two elements. The study participant has to make a choice. And by monitoring the signals through the brain, the neuroscientists were able to determine they're going to choose this 12 seconds in advance. There have been previous studies that started at four seconds. Later, there was a study that showed 10 seconds. Now they're up to 12 seconds. With science and the advances that come with it, who knows, maybe in a year, they might be able to tell what choices we would make uh, an hour in advance. Now, the challenge to this, though, is I feel like I have free will. I feel like I'm making my own choices. And that's important. And that's the problem. How can you feel like you're free and that you're making your own choices when everything says that you're not? Well, there might be some hope here. Werner Heisenberg and the uncertainty principle. Looking at... Um, elements at the subatomic level, they show that there's a possibility that there is some free will. What does this mean for you? Neuromarketing is something that's coming about. Advertisers um, creating conditions where they monitor your biological responses to determine what they're going to sell you and how they're going to sell it to you. Another problem with free will, and if it doesn't exist, moral accountability. There's a really great uh, example of a man um, commits a crime, goes before the judge and says, hey, I didn't have a choice in the matter. How can you punish me for what I did? You can't hold me accountable. It wasn't by choice. So, even though for philosophers, for scientists, pretty much everything shows that we don't have free will, that we don't have a choice. Our actions are predetermined. We still feel like we have choice, and that's important. As the British poet Samuel Johnson said, all theory is against the freedom of will. All experience, though, is for it. Thank you. So I'm Lindsay Cheney, and as and as um, uh, Dr. Allred said, we kind of went from large from the cosmos, the community to the individual. And so now I'm on the smallest scale. I'm going to talk to you about the human genome and what we know and don't know about the human genome. So what is the genome? Um, your genome is basically all of your DNA in your body. It's just a fancy word for all of your DNA. 
So this DNA, it's uh, this code that's made up of these A, T's, G's, and C's. Those are their nick nicknames of these nucleotides, and they pair A's with T's, G's with C's. Make this twisted ladder shape, this double helix. And then these, this, this twisted ladder will bind, um, bind and twist to make a chromosome. So in each of your cells, in humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. If you were to take all of that DNA just from one cell and stretch it out, it'd be over six feet tall. Okay, so there's six billion A, T, G's, and C's just in one cell. Okay, so then if you were going to take all of your cells in your body, you have about one trillion cells in your body, and you were to stretch out all of the DNA from all of those one trillion cells, you would have about 110 billion miles of DNA. So that's enough to go from the sun back to the earth round trip about 600 times. Okay, so these A, T's, G's, and C's, this DNA, it makes up who we are. Um, if we have blue eyes or brown eyes or dark hair or light hair, um, what diseases we might have. So for example, this is just a tiny bit of um, the, the gene that influences eye color. Okay, and so it's kind of a code um, how these A, T's, G's, and C's are arranged. Mix up, that you read it in this three-letter code. Um, it's kind of a secret language to determine what amino acids are, are, are made and then what proteins are made to then determine those, those traits that you have. Okay, so your genome, so you get half of your genome from your mom, half from your dad, it determines your height, your eye color, your disease. But your DNA is not your destiny. There's much more to determine who you are. For instance, your lifestyle, your environment, how well you eat, or where you live, how much sun exposure you have, um, those influence your, your genetic makeup also. So it's all, your genes and your environment working together. So our genomes, human genomes, were 99.9% .9 identical, genetically identical. Okay, so that means that we're more similar than we are different. But given that we have um, those um, six billion base pairs or no nucleotides, that leaves about three million differences just in that 0.1%. But most of those differences, it's unique that most of those differences are found within ethnic groups than they are between ethnic groups. So let's, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we came to know this knowledge, a little bit of background on the human, um, learning about human genetics. So first we'll go to Gregor Mendel and his famous experiments with peas. And so back in 1865 is when he did his pea experiments and saw that, um, that basically something's being passed along to offspring. This is something being passed from parents to offspring. But at, Me at Mendel's time, we still had no idea what DNA was. Um, Fred Mischer, he, he looked at white blood cells that were found in um, bandages from old wounds. So he'd go around to hospitals and collect these bandages. And he discovered that whatever this substance was that was transmitting this, this process, this inheritance, um, he called it nuclein. So basically it was DNA and some other proteins, but it was found in cells. Okay, so we discovered that it's in cells. Something in cells is allowing this transmission of information, transmission of information. Um, it wasn't until 1952 that Rosalind Franklin, she's one of my favorite scientists, um, took this famous photograph 51, this picture of DNA. And through her work, um, James Watson and Francis Crick were able to, and the work of others, they came up with this structure, that double helix structure of DNA. So this, knowing what DNA even looked like, occurred in 1953. So this is probably in your grandparents' lifetime that we have discovered what DNA even is. So since that time, um, we discovered the code of how, how those A, T's, G's, and C's will make up the proteins. Um, big leap happened in 1977 with Sanger sequencing. And so now we can sequence what those orders are in our DNA, where those A, T, G's, and C's are. Um, and then in 1983, 
this PCR, so basically this ability to copy DNA was invented. And so now we can really research DNA because we're able to make copies of it. So in 1995, that's when H. influenza, it's not the flu, but it also can make you sick, it's a bacteria. It was the first genome sequenced by this new shotgun method of sequencing. And so that's similar to the type of genome sequencing that we have today. And so it was in 1990 that the Human Genome Project began, and they um, planned it to last about 15 years, but it ended up taking 13. So this was the project to sequence the first human genome. So they were able to finish it in 2003, this first sequence of the whole entire human genome. And this sequence that they've done is very well done. It has very few errors. Um, but it took a really long time, and it cost about $3 billion to do one human genome. And it wasn't from one person. They kind of hodgepodged it so they didn't know who, whose genome it really was. Today, to sequence a human genome, less than $1,000. You can get a direct to, to consumer sequencing for like 23andMe or Ancestry for about $100, $150. That doesn't sequence your whole genome, it just does little snippets. But still, the cost of sequencing is, has dropped dramatically. And so as a result, there's been hundreds of thousands of human genomes already sequenced, um, and many, many plants, animals, bacteria, viruses. Um, the day genome sequencing is really prevalent in biology research. One thing big that we discovered through this human genome project was how little of our DNA actually codes for those proteins. So those important proteins that allow us to see or have diseases. So only about 2% of our DNA actually codes for these genes. And so that's been a big research um, focus in the past decade is finding out what does this junk DNA do? So it used to be known as junk DNA. But we realize it's actually really important about 80% of it carries some sort of function, usually with regulating, turning on and off genes. Um, but it's also been associated with different diseases. And so predicting cancers or even autism um, can be found in some of these non-coding parts of our DNA. So one of the, so even though genome sequencing has been a lot more common, um, and thousands of, hundreds of thousands of genomes have been, human genomes have been sequenced, most of those genomes have been from people of northern European descent. And so our picture of the entire global human genome has been kind of limited in that sense. And so that's really one of the biggest focuses in human genomics research now. And so there's an initiative to sequence a million people. It's this All of Us research program. And let me explain a couple reasons why this is really important. Um, blonde hair, for instance, usually that's associated with people from Northern Europe, but there's a population of people in the Pacific Island, the Melanese people, and about 10%, they have really dark skin, and about 10% of those, that population, they have blonde hair. So they went to research, where did this blonde hair come from? They likely thought that it was a European um, sailor or someone that came to those islands and had a lot of children. It was a completely different genetic mechanism to make blonde hair in these populations as it was from Northern Europeans. So even though you still see the blonde hair, completely different DNA to make that happen. Something else, lactase persistence. So most mammals can't drink milk beyond infancy. Okay? But being able to digest milk, you need the, um, the gene lactase to persist. And so in northern European populations, usually, that we're able to um, drink milk as an adult. Similarly, there's one other place in Africa, a pastoral community, um, that also is able to digest, digest milk as adults. And so this is something that's completely been evolved separately from different genes that were involved in this. So if there's different genes involved in blonde hair or lactase persistency, there's probably different genes that are involved in diabetes. There's different ways that diabetes is manifested in different people. And so there's probably a different genetic mechanism behind that. And so understanding more of our genome, we'll be able to have precision medicine. Medicine that's designed specifically for your genes. Um, also with this initiative, there's going to be a lot more money put into genetic counseling. So with all these people getting their genome sequenced, 
there's going to be counselors that are trained to talk about these, these things. Other future um, research in genomics um, is sequencing of all other plants, animals. Those numbers are going to keep growing. So avocado was a genome that was recently published, one of the most recent published genomes. Um, and so avocados, they're they're expected to have a dramatic decrease in yields in California due to climate change with the high increased temperature and decreased precipitation. But now that its genome is sequenced, we're able to maybe target our breeding programs to, pre, um, to create more disease resistant avocados or even temperature sensitive, less temperature sensitive and drought resistant varieties. Also, understanding more of our human genome, we're going to be able to identify more diseases. So we know most genes and what they do, but still that picture is really unclear. And so we're going to be able to better paint a picture of what, where obesity, triggers for obesity, or autism, or cancer, and those genetic mechanisms behind that. Other big future areas is CRISPR. So CRISPR is basically a method that you can use to edit genes, to edit DNA. So you can cut out DNA um, and change what it looks like. So some recent things that just happened in the, in the news, scientists made an albino lizard. Okay? Or there's talk of being able to use um, CRISPR for cancer treatments or to halt progression of breast cancer. It hit the news big last November when he Jukha from China um, used CRISPR to alter the the DNA of one embryo. There was twins, and he altered it in one of the embryos um, so that the, that twin was HIV resistant. And so there's a lot of ethical concerns of how should CRISPR be used. And so those are a lot of going to be the big next questions in genomics of what do we do with this knowledge now that we have so much of it. Another big up and coming area too is our microbiome. So in and on us, we have more microorganisms than we do our own human cells. So, there are, so if you sequence all the genomes of your bacteria and funguses and yeast that live on it in you, it's going to be over 100 times of your DNA. Okay? So much bigger than that trip to the sun. And so we're understanding more and more the important role of this microbiome. All bacteria is not bad. But the benefits of our microbiome and how, what changes it. Really, our future of genomics is with you. And this, there's going to be, scientists say, there's two phases in, in history, those before genome sequencing and those after. There's going to be sequencers in our homes, in our, in our fields, like so scientists can go out in the field and sequence right then. The, the technology is there, and so the biggest thing is now, what are we going to do with it? Thanks. Thank you for those presentations. We have a couple of minutes for questions. If anyone has a question for the whole group or any individual presenter. Why don't you shout out your question? I tell my students that it's okay to be frustrated, but only for a few hours. Uh, but it's also kind of the attraction and the allure of going into science, as you know there's always going to be unanswered questions, and that's actually what we really enjoy. For political science, one of our big worries, of course, is that a democracy will collapse because of all of the pressures that's in there. So it, it is a worry thing, and it may sound weird, but it does sometimes keep me awake at night. I wonder, can we withstand and can we uh, hold on and get through these problems that are going to be facing us? Uh, short answer, no. Um, that's what philosophers do, is ask questions and sometimes, usually there aren't answers. Um, but just asking the question in and of itself is the, the point, the goal. When I was in high school, I really liked biology as opposed to like English or history because I thought it was really black and white. And the further I've studied biology, I realized that that's not true and there's so much that we don't know and things are messy. <laughs> 
Yeah, unfortunately, we are out of time, and I need to let you go to your next class. But if you have some individual questions, I'm sure you can come up and ask them. Let's give our presenters one more round of applause, though. I'm at a party I don't want to be at, and I don't ever wear a suit and tie. I'm wondering if I can sneak up.